for His great love, wherewith God loved us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today, there's a, there are a lot of things that we can reflect on. We can reflect on the circumcision of our Lord. We can reflect about His holy name, which tomorrow we celebrate as a feast. We can even speak about and reflect on all the great privileges of the Mother of God. But I would like to focus on one specific idea, and we find this in the magnificent Magnificat Antiphon that we said as a church last night, yesterday evening. And it says, For His great love wherewith God loved us, He sent His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And this says it all about this great mystery we have considered in all these days, the Christmas grace. St. John sums it up in his own epistle where he says the reason for the appearance of the Son of God was to undo the works of Satan. So here's what it all means. We who are plagued by the seven capital sins, we who are tempted beyond our liking, we who are in the throes of even despair at times, we who are plunged in doubts, we who are vexed by many anxieties, we who are immersed in family feuds, we who struggle living out the highest ideals and the sincerest of resolutions, we are pardoned and grafted into the visible appearance of our dear Savior. And thus, we are caught up in invisible love, as the preface says for Christmas. And therefore, this is the season to be jolly. Joy and utter hope. Joy and hope. Because the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, cleansing us from our sinful flesh and His flesh. And so we must be aware of what is the octave of Christmas. Of course, we have Christmas Day, the Christmas graces. But we also have a thing called the octave of Christmas. That means that all of these eight days is Christmas Day again. We're reliving the Christmas Day, the Christmas grace. It is Christmas Day right now in, in, in that of grace. Even in the canon, the priest will say, this holy day, the Savior is born, and so forth. It's almost like Holy Mother Church wants to ingrain in us all of these beautiful graces. And it's not just enough to have one hit on the nail. We have to pound it eight times so that this grace can come in us. And so today is Christmas, and we receive this grace. The Word was made flesh and dwells among us. And therefore we can say goodbye to our despair, to our hopelessness, to our sadness, to our despair when we say we cannot progress in virtue when we say it's too much for us, when the struggles of life overwhelm us. It's a very beautiful thing to reflect on what St. Leo the Great said. He lived as a pope from the years 440 to 461. And he has a beautiful sermon on Christmas night, Christmas Day. He says, it is out of place for us to be sad today. There's no room for sadness. And we can say that about all the days of the octave of Christmas. He says, art thou a saint? Then thou art nearer to thy victory. Art thou a sinner? Then thou art pardoned. 
Art thou a pagan? Then thou art called to life by God. And so he says that there's absolutely no one on the planet that has a right to be sad on this holy day. And we can even include it in all the days of the octave as we relive this grace of Christmas each day that ends today. We should not be sad. We should be hopeful. And he says, why is this? Why should we not be sad today? Because Christ conquers Satan, but not in a glorious majesty of his divinity purely, but rather he defeats Satan in the lowliness of our flesh. That is the field by which he's going to, to do battle against the devil. In our own weaknesses, in our own flesh, he's going to defeat Satan and the powers of evil. What a tremendous, tremendous grace. And these who claim, but Father, Christmas has come and gone just like usual. Nothing but one swig of eggnog. Nothing else. Well, what a tragedy for that person who has not taken advantage of these graces. Why didn't you contemplate the mystery with, with Mary? And so much, so much good could be done to the soul. Remember those words of St. Luke's Gospel as she pondered these things in her heart. She pondered all of these things as were occurring in the stable, in the infancy of Christ. Are there excuses of not having experienced Christ this Christmas? What are these excuses? My children impeded me. My crisis was too powerful to, to focus more on other things. I was too tired to contemplate the holy infancy of Christ is consoling and cleansing and is probably one of the most easiest things to do in our spiritual life. Obviously, but though we need the Spirit from our Sacrament of Confirmation to grant us to this. The seven gifts of the Holy Ghost that we receive in baptism. But all we have to do is make the minimal effort to open our eyes to the great mystery before us, the great stable where Christ is born in the manger to console us, to convince us of His great love, giving us a new heart, giving us a new mind, helping us to be humble. In that simple gaze, I would argue all of our struggles and failures and faults and even our weaknesses and our sinfulness and even our sadness, plus... A profound, simple gaze to the little Christ in Bethlehem equals new hope, joy, cleansing, a new path, a new leaf. Those of us who make those New Year's resolutions, we have ample reason to do so today as we contemplate the great mystery of our redemption. So to conclude, here we are in the final stretch of this Christmas bonanza for our souls. Let us give the baby Jesus our hearts as the priest pulls down upon the altar his flesh from heaven. At communion time, as we come close and receive Christ in Holy Communion, Let us ask him with these ardent words as he taught us in the Holy Gospel. Lord, make me meek and humble of heart and make my heart more like unto thine. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.